Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers, hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. Hi, this is Ben Kaspit from Tel Aviv with a brand new episode of Own Israel. Jews fasted this week to mark the destruction of their two ancient temples in Jerusalem. According to Jewish tradition, the temples were destroyed mainly because of the hatred and infighting among the Jews. The civil wars between moderates and zealots undermined the foundations of Jewish sovereignty and not because of colonial ambitions of the Babylonians and Romans who conquered Jerusalem. It seems that since those long ago days, 2,000 and more years ago, neither the Jews nor their modern homeland have ever been closer to civil war than they are today. Stormy demonstrations are being held every day around the country, mostly against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, but also for him. Thugs are running wild and beating up protesters. Death threats are issued on social media and a general climate of burning hatred and deep division pits the two rival camps against each other with bare teeth and throbbing veins. One camp is convinced that Netanyahu is a disaster and must step down. The other swears he is the Messiah incarnate here to save Israel from its enemies. The political arena is also in an uproar of unprecedented chaos, even for Israel. The so-called unity government and the scheduled job switch between Netanyahu and Benny Gantz was born in sin just over three months ago. It is now fluttering between life and death. Netanyahu does not intend to make good on his pledge to change jobs with Benny Gantz in November 2021 and probably never intended to do so. Gantz has lost his political base and is now the punching bag of the disappointed Israelis who voted for him in order to get rid of Netanyahu. Gantz is determined to force Netanyahu to keep their agreement, specifically the approval of a two-year budget rather than the one-year budget for which Netanyahu is now pushing. The budget battle will determine the fate of this government and probably of Netanyahu and Gantz. With his trial on corruption charges set to begin in January, the Prime Minister knows he will be spending most of his time next year in front of three judges in Jerusalem court. He has therefore decided that if he is going to violate the coalition agreement and go for new elections, it's now or never. Netanyahu's problem is that his ratings are plunging and his Likud party is losing one or two Knesset seats with every passing poll. From a peak of over 40 Knesset seats, he is now nearing 30. He wants to stop the bleeding and cut his losses before a serious new rival emerges to challenge him, before the anti-Netanyahu camp regroups. The only current rival is Yair Lapid. The gamble he took in refusing to join the Netanyahu government earlier this year has proven itself big time. Lapid's centrist party is nearing the 20-seat mark in the polls, while Netanyahu's Likud appears to be edging downward to meet it. Lapid believes there is a good chance he can level the playing field with Netanyahu, and then all bets are off. Lapid is determined not to compromise and not to be second or third in command of decorated generals anymore. The adventure with generals Gantz and Ashkenazi was enough. Can Lapid break through the glass ceiling? Will he be able to take on Netanyahu? Yair Lapid, the head of the Knesset opposition, is our guest on today's Al Monitor podcast. We will return right after this brief commercial break. If you're listening to this podcast, you obviously care about the Middle East. And if you do, you should probably be reading El Monitor. 
El Monitor is a global newsroom headquartered in Washington, D.C., with a network of over 160 contributors around the world. El Monitor offers first-class reporting and analysis from a range of perspectives and an approach that represents the highest journalistic standards, as well as an award-winning commitment to press freedom and independence. If you haven't done so already, visit us at elmonitor.com, check out our articles, and sign up for our free newsletters. There's a lot to choose from, including the Week in Review, an essay that offers unusual insights and forecasts into the region based upon El Monitor's outstanding reporting. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to our El Monitor podcast on your favorite podcast platform, on Israel with Ben Caspit and on the Middle East with me, Andrew Parasoliti. Shalom Yair Lapid, Chair of the Eshatit uh, Telem Party. Thank you for joining On Israel Podcast here at Al Monitor. Shalom Yair. Shalom, good to be here. I, I, I hardly believe myself when I'm asking you the, the first question, and it is, do you sense that Israel is on the verge of a civil war? Well, I wouldn't go that far. I will, and what I do sense is that there is a civil unrest, People are angry, frustrated. People feel uncomfortable with this humongous, ridiculous government of 36 ministers and 16 deputy ministers in a time of, of a, national, a national and international crisis. So uh, they're out there in the streets and just spend the entire weekend with demonstrators all around the country. And they're saying something loud and clear. We are unhappy and we're not going to stop until something fundamental is changed. Do you think there is a real threat on Israel's democracy? Or uh, in other words, what is the, the real reason that gets people to leave their families in a corona crisis and go demonstrate all over in Balfour, in Jerusalem, in Caesarea, where the prime minister's uh, private residence, in Tel Aviv, and in 270 junctions and bridges all over the state? What, what is the drive? Well, yes, I think there is a real threat to Israel's democracy because we have a prime minister who came to the conclusion that if Israel stays a full functional democracy, then he's going to jail. And therefore, he wants us to be less of a democracy. In, 20, in the 21st century, century, democracies are not uh, uh, dying, they are eroding. Uh, what is happening is Netanyahu wants us to be less of a democracy. It comes with an international or global process of uh, what is uh, going to be known as uh, the democratic recession. Uh, but here in Israel, we have a specific issue that influenced the whole thing, which is uh, the crime, crime, crime minister's, uh, the prime minister's uh, uh, legal issues. And therefore, he wants us to be... Uh, democracy minus and the people of israel are not willing to live in a democracy minus and therefore we're going to fight to make sure this doesn't happen i remember the protest in 2011 of the social justice protesters in tel aviv and the politicians tried to stay out of it and were very cautious in going in with all their energy and and, and force and now in 2020, I see you and Bogi Alon, your uh, a partner in uh, Yeshati Telem, and many of your uh, uh, of the, the other uh, members of Knesset from your party going in, uh, not hesitating. So, don't you fear it will make the whole thing political, and people will say, "Yes, Yair Lapid wants wants to be the next prime minister," so he's, he's using this protest as a political tool. First of all, it is political. They are not demonstrating over, I don't know, something that, you know, is, is, is objective. They're, they're, it's a political demonstrations over political issues, especially this government. It's, a, it's fueled by political anger. We are part of it. We are, we've been uh, particularly cautious about making sure we're not, you know, it doesn't become a grapple in which we are 
struggling in in order to take over. We're not trying to take over, but we are. It's it's part of our set of beliefs, and we are there because we believe it's the right demonstrations and the right cause. And I'm in politics to fight for just causes the way I see them, and this is why my friends are there. So we are part of it. We're not taking over. We we are actually, you know, even on the bridges and in Balfour. We're coming in, we're coming in modestly, but we are there and we are there as Yeshati Telem because this is who we are. This is it's not only a political party, it's it's the way it's our way of self-definition. So uh, no, I'm not worried it will become political because it is already political, it was born political. It's like the famous Vislava Shimborskaya uh, poem, everything is political. Do you think this process can uh, make make the, the difference? Do you think uh, Netanyahu's uh, throne or chair is, uh, is shaking right now, right now? Because as we know, both uh, the Prime Minister is sitting there in, inside Balfour and he fears this uh, phenomena. He, he claims that uh, it's very, you know, it's anecdotal and it's uh, the anarchist uh, youngsters or uh, extreme left and he is trying to, to paint you as an extremist or a lefty, don't you fear this, all these uh, accusations? No. First of all, uh, uh, you can tell that it has an impact by the complete hysteria in which he treats the, the demonstrators and the demonstrations. I mean, if you are calm and, and uh, collected opposite anything, then you don't tweet 50 times a day against it. You would just say, I mean, if he wasn't hysterical, he would have probably said something about the fact that this is uh, um, um, the right of the people to say something about the right of the people to demonstrate in a democracy and go on with his business. He didn't. He's completely hysterical about it, and rightly so, because, yes, it is shaking his throne or chair or whatever you want to call it. And I'm not afraid of him saying that we are leftist or anarchist because I'm not afraid of him, period. I, am, I got tired at some point of, of answering every time he's pointing at me or others or my friends or my uh, party and trying to label us or name names. If people want to know what Yeshatid is, what I am, they should do one very simple thing, is, which is asking us. I'm a centrist. I've been a centrist all my life. I'm the leader of a centrist party. I'm the leader of an opposition that is not homogenic, it's heterogenic, it's built from all the way from Bennett and Lieberman to the joint party. And, uh, and we are in the center of this as well. So uh, the fact that Netanyahu is, is calling names to everybody who opposes him doesn't mean he's right, it just means that he's hysterical. It's not only calling names, uh, the prime minister and, and his people are claiming all the time that there are death threats against him and his family in an unprecedented numbers he is called uh, on you and other leaders of opposition to denounce, denounce all these threats. How do you see this and don't you fear that um, we might or you might or, or, or the people might lose control on the protest and we will start, start seeing violence? Up until now, this is a very non-violent uh, uh, movement. I mean, this is more uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi than, I don't know, than the, uh, the Israeli Gandhi. Um, I understand that the Prime Minister is worried and everybody's worried. Nobody wants violence. And of course, I denounce any uh, violent threats, including the ones that are pointing at uh, Avichai Mandelblit and Liat Ben Ari who are going around with guards. I, uh, of course, I'm, I'm denouncing any threats toward the Prime Minister. Let me remind you that the Prime Minister is the, probably the most protected person in the Middle East and maybe one of the top five in the world. So uh, hopefully Shabak is doing his work and is going to stay protected, safe and sound. And so this is what, uh, uh, this is the way it should be. Um, uh, on top of this, the majority or 99% uh, of the incitement is coming from the prime ministers and his surroundings. The prime minister and his surroundings. It is, it is unbelievable to me that the most most divisive 
political figure in the history of Israel is keep on complaining. I mean, in between one incitement and another, he's complaining about the incitement against him. No, you are the one who's doing the majority of incitement and you did so all your life and political career. So don't complain to us. Nobody threatening you, you are threatening a lot of people. Yair Lapid, do you think you can convince enough Israelis to see you as a viable candidate for prime minister? Have you matured enough in order to step into these, uh, maybe these sh very wide shoes and become a figure that the Israelis will vote for as a prime minister, law, not the leader of opposition, not the leader of Yeshati, not the minister of finance, a prime minister, because you know Israelis are frightened. As, as a whole, we, we live in a, in a get, still in a ghetto and they need someone to protect them. Do, do you think you are there already? Yes, I think uh, Netanyahu has been around for so long that he became the role model of what a prime minister should be up until recently, but not anymore. Uh, I I think what happened recently is that people are looking at him and said, okay, he's been there for too long and we need something else. I don't want to duplicate him. I don't want to be a second Netanyahu. Uh, my, and what I'm telling the Israeli people is I'm not coming there by myself. I'm coming there as a head of a very skilled team. I, I mean, if, there was, if there's one thing even, even my enemies admit is the fact that I know, always knew and I know how to lead a team, how to work with other people, how to empower other people, which is something Netanyahu lacked. So what I've been telling them is that if you vote for me, you're not voting only for me, but you vote for a group of very talented, skilled, experienced people who's been now in politics for uh, eight years, who's learned it, every, the, the lessons the hard way, and also that has proved that they are men of the word and will not back on the world, uh, even when they go and get stuff. Talking so, uh, yes. And you know what? It's not only me telling you this about myself. This is also what the polls are saying. I'm not only the leader of the opposition, but also number two in every poll that was made lately in terms of suitability to prime minister. Again, the incumbent in every election has an advantage just by being there. But if you want to see an alternative, you're looking to who's number two, and this, this is right now me. Hopefully, I will be number one after the next election. I'm going to lead Eshatid and the opposition to the next election. By definition, the leader of the opposition is the candidate for prime minister. Following uh, a follow-up on this, you, 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 you just uh, talk about, uh, talked about the team and skilled and experienced people in your team so let, let's speak about two of them, two generals, two ex-chiefs uh, uh, of uh, staff of the Israeli army uh, were separated from uh, Yeshatid. I'm talking about the blue, blue and white guys, uh, Benny Gantz uh, and Gabi Ashkenazi. And I oh, really? I, I didn't know who are you talking about. <laughs> and I understand you have had enough of generals. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, I think, I think I always, I mean, I think that people who served the, the country for the, their entire life uh, are, are usually good people. We, I, I agree with you, we had bad experience. They have uh, 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 betrayed their voters, their friends, their allies, the people they were, they were, form, were trying to form a, a, a political movement with, which is a shame. And they should be shame on this. They should shame on themselves. But this doesn't mean we're now going to exclude any anyone just because he served this country his entire life. Bogi alone is a is a is a great friend and a great uh, uh, person to work with. I know who you were referring to or hinting to. If people, some, somebody like Gandhi Isaacot would like to join us, we'll be more than delighted because he's a good man. But why uh, still in my question? Let me ask about it. Okay, go ahead and ask your question. As I, as I tweeted a few days ago, your first uh, real uh, meeting, political and, 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 and the security meeting with ex-Chief of Staff Gadi Eisenkot uh, took place a week ago or 10 days ago. And do you, are you optimistic uh, about the, the possibility that the General Eisenkot 
who will join Yesh Atid. And can you say loud and clear that you're not going to be the number, anybody's number two anymore? I am not going to be number, anybody's number two anymore ever in my life. Not me, not Yesh Atid. We have learned this lesson the hard way. And besides, it's our time. There is, in politics, there's such a thing that uh, what is your, your time, and this is our time, and, uh, um, and, and we are ready, as I was saying. Again, Gadi Isaacot is a great guy, and uh, uh, we, we talk because, we, we, because I talk to every, uh, uh, everyone in, in the political or possible uh, uh, political arena or people who are, are possible figures. Right now, what we mostly talk about is security issues and defense issues, which we, we used to be uh, discussing when I was in cabinet and later on when I was part of the security uh, and foreign affairs committee, uh, when he was commander in chief, and we will keep on talking. And the reason we're gonna keep on talking is not because I'm not gonna tell you what we're talking about. You can give me a hint. No, I'm not in hinting business. <laughs> uh, Okay, I, I want to ask you uh, if, do you think in a, in a retrospective, wasn't it a mistake to, to tear Kahol Lavan blue and white to two pieces and not staying together as a huge alternative to Netanyahu right now? Is it reversible? And don't you think any advantage in the fact that we have now Avi Nisankorn as a Minister of Justice a guarding the Attorney General and all the others, you know, a few things about Gantz and Ashkenazi being there now, not letting Netanyahu become the dictator he wants to be, supposedly. Don't you see any advantage in it? First, well, if you asked a few things in the same time. Yes. First of all, yes, I think it was a huge mistake to tear up Kahol Avan. It wasn't my mistake. If it was up to me, there would still be a Kahol Aman and we would be still be an alternative uh, uh, to Netanyahu. Uh, all we needed to do at the time is wait another week and uh, um, uh, uh, making Mayor Cohen into uh, uh, Speaker of Knesset and, and changing the law uh, about the ability of somebody with indictments to run for Prime Minister and we'll be in a whole different ballgame. I don't know. Why is it that Benny Gantz and Gabi Ashkenazi decided to split Kahol Avan and crawl into, I have no better phrase, and Netanyahu's government, but this you need to ask them, not me. Um, if there is a possibility of, of uh, 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 a unification or reunification, I don't think so. I don't think, as I was saying, there's no way we're going to be under them. I don't think they're going to be, I mean, if they want to come under me and Yeshati, then we can discuss this because the most important thing right now is to make sure that Netanyahu is not Israel's prime minister anymore because he's doing the country a whole world of harm and damage because uh, opposite everything, the economy, the way he, he, he handles the corona crisis, the way he handles the, you know what, the nation's spirit and our ability to live together as one people. Um, which brings me to the last part of your question. Not it doesn't it, it doesn't comfort me that Tavi Nissan Cohen is the Minister of Justice or that they stay there for I don't know another vote in Knesset and saying we're going to change something, because it makes people feel that something that is fundamentally wrong might be right. There's something totally wrong about the idea that a million and some people voted to take to get Netanyahu out of Balfour out of the prime minister's office to change the course in which the Israel is going to uh, uh, make it impossible to somebody who is uh, charged with uh, corruption to be the prime minister of Israel. And they sit there and they change, I don't know, one uh, small position here and there and they say, you see, everything is all right. No, everything is not all right. Everything is totally wrong. And you are there and you make and you enable this and you're making this possible. And therefore you have betrayed any principle you yourself had in your life. So no, I'm not happy they're there. I'm, I think it's, it's a miserable idea and a miserable mistake that they made. 
just let me understand if, if I understood you, if they apologize publicly and agree to be you know, Benny Gantz number two and then Bogi Alon and Gabi Ashkenazi number four, we can start over uh, all over again. I, listen, it's not about apologies. Forget about the apology. It will not happen. But, okay. Yeah, it's not about the apologies. It's about the fact that if somebody has betrayed your faith, and he wants to come back, you tell him, yes, but you're not going to be in control anymore because I don't trust you. Trust is an important thing. You know what? In ways, you and I have been players for a long time. So I think I'm like them. So I think we understand the basic rule. The basic rule is that you tend to forget in politics that after all the, the, the gaming and the playing around, it is about principles. It is about what you think is right for the country. It is about world view. And if you don't have all these, then you're not entitled to claim uh, that you are capable of, of leading other people. I have uh, two more questions. Uh, the first is many analysts look at you as a lame candidate because of your relationship with the ultra-Orthodox that uh, cannot look at your direction. Do you think you can, you can swear this circle and become a, a legitimate candidate in their eyes also? Because, you know, one cannot uh, uh, form a government or a coalition in Israel without the 15, 16 mandates of the Orthodox uh, in the Knesset. Let me remind you, I did. In 2013, this is exactly what we did. We formed a government without the Wesley Kuhn. Now, I, I, I am, so A, it is possible. B, this is, this is if, if, if somebody is saying this makes me a lame candidate, he hasn't been reading the, the, the media lately, and especially the ultra-orthodox media, because they've been saying for a year now, uh, uh, us disqualifying Lapid is yesterday news. They know me well enough to know that I will not change my basic views, not about the draft bill, not about the necessity for young Haredi children to study English and, and math. On the other hand, uh, uh, there is a way to form a government with the ultra-Orthodox, and that is to win an election. I'm telling you in advance, if we will win, win the election, if we will have more seats than we could, I will approach them, I will talk to them, I will tell them, let's discuss uh, the, 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 what kind of uh, 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 possible movements we can have together, and I will negotiate with them, as I will with anybody else, uh, uh, except from the ex ex extremists from both sides. So I will not discuss future governments, not with Ballard and not with uh, Itamar Benvir, but aside from there, uh, you can uh, have uh, political uh, uh, discussions with everybody. So what I'm saying is, this is just the news. We are capable of, we are experienced enough, we are, we are smart enough politically to be able to discuss possibilities with everybody. My last question is a follow-up about one of your earlier answers in this uh, conversation. You said you do not, do, do not want to duplicate Netanyahu to be the, the new Bibi, the 2020 version of Bibi. So I want to surprise you and ask you, who do you want to duplicate? Who is your uh, uh, idol prime minister? You can combine one from a few of them. Who do you want to be like in the Israeli history? In the Israeli history? <sighs> It's, 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 a, a, tough it's a question, well... A tough and a tricky one. Yes, it is a tough and a tricky one. Uh, uh, behind my back in Knesset, I'm now in my Tel Aviv office, there, there are two pictures of Ben Gurion and, and uh, Begin. And uh, when people come to my, my, my room, they always look at the two pictures and say, how can they be, there to get, to be, be here together? And I always tell them, they, they, they are not here, I didn't hang them, they ran over, they are hiding here because labor, of course, has completely neglected the principles and views of Ben-Gurion who, who was biblical in his passion to, towards Israel and towards the revival of the Jewish people in uh, 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 the land of the prophets. And on the other hand, the Likud has neglected completely 
the devotion Begin had for liberal ideas and views and uh, uh, the importance of things like the Supreme Court, like opposition being uh, of defending the opposition or defending minorities. So these are, of course, the two leaders I, I, I look up to. It's not that I want to be like, because you cannot be like anybody, uh, um, times are changing. But if you're asking me who do I look up to, this, these two uh, uh, giants of our past are the people I look up to. I'll call them David Ben Begin. This will be David Ben Begin is, is a, yeah, it's a very good phrase. Uh, head of Yeshati, uh, Telem Yair Lapid, head of opposition. I thank you very much for this interesting conversation in in our podcast. Thank you very much indeed. Have a very good week, and we will be right back after a, a short commercial break. Don't go anywhere. Thank you, Yair. Thank you. Shalom. If you're listening to this podcast, you obviously care about the Middle East, and if you do, you should probably be reading El Monitor. El Monitor is a global newsroom headquartered in Washington, D.C., with a network of over 160 contributors around the world. El Monitor offers first-class reporting and analysis from a range of perspectives and an approach that represents the highest journalistic standards, as well as an award-winning commitment to press freedom and independence. If you haven't done so already, visit us at elmonitor.com, check out our articles, and sign up for our free newsletters. There's a lot to choose from, including the Week in Review, an essay that offers unusual insights and forecasts into the region based upon El Monitor's outstanding reporting. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to our El Monitor podcast on your favorite podcast platform, on Israel with Ben Caspit, and on the Middle East with me. Andrew Parasoliti. Yair Lapid is determined like never before. Eight years after he quit his prestigious post as a popular columnist and national TV anchor, Lapid feels that his time has finally arrived. Fearless and sharp, he believes that he can be the BB killer, metaphorically, of course, and he's not going to be anybody's number two anymore. Lapid told us that democracies do not die, they erode, and Israeli he thinks it's getting closer to be a democracy minus. Although his problematic relationship with the crucial Orthodox parties, Lapid is confident that he will be able to square the circle, win the election, and form a coalition against all odds. The burden of proof lays on Lapid's shoulders, and it's impossible to predict right now his chances, his real chances of success. One thing is sure, for Yai Lapid, the timing is perfect. He is up to this very tough mission, and it can be his first real claim to the throne, and the last one as well. Thank you for listening to us. We will meet you hopefully here back next Monday in On Israel and I'll monitor. Take care.